to ABA Inside Trek, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and here is episode 19, Parent Training to Decrease Challenging Behavior. I'm joined, as always, by my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob. It's Diana. Hello, Rob. I'm Jackie, and here today to discuss things with you. Oh, good. I'm so glad you're here to discuss things with me. It's my favorite. So many things. So many things. So many things to be discussed. Right. So for those of you who are new to the show, we're a podcast where we read articles in the behavior analytic literature on a given topic. Then we discuss it and pass the savings on to you, our friends at home. This episode's topic is actually a listener request. We had a request on what are some ways that I can help the parents I work with? And we said, that's a great idea for a topic. Let's look into it, specifically around challenging behavior, which is probably one of the main reasons that uh, consultants are called in. And unfortunately, there was not a lot of literature on the topic. So, Diana nope. and, and Jackie, mm-hmm. you, you, did, you, you usually do most of the sort of background research, unless it's a topic I have more experience in. So what was, what was sort of the, the tenor of that research search? When I was looking around, I was focused specifically on looking for parent training related to decreasing challenging behavior. There's not a lot out there on that, but there is a lot of information out there on teaching parents how to increase behavior that we want to see. So it's not that there hasn't been parent training work done in our field. It's just been more focused on the increasing behavior side. And I think that there's definitely room to work on the side of decreasing challenging behavior, but it's also a topic that we want to approach with caution. Because if we're talking about challenging behavior in the home that could be potentially serious and harmful for the child or other members of the home, we don't want parents attempting to tackle those types of problems on their own at all. That is the work of the behavior analyst, and parents would most definitely want to have someone supervising that very closely and working as the expert in that situation. So I don't know that that's the reason why we don't have a lot of research out there. I wouldn't really think so, but I think that that's something to keep in mind as we're approaching this topic. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, it's I think, one of those scary topics that if you put out research into the world, then it could be replicated by someone right. that, you know, it may not be appropriate for, right, for replication. So I think maybe that's one of the other reasons, too. Yeah, and it can be really complex. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I would think you'd still, I mean, it's always nice to have a body of literature on the subject of... For practitioners, here are some research-based tips to improve the training experience. Sort of like, well, everyone knows how to coach people to engage in all sorts of different behaviors, but there's still a need for research related to behavioral skills training to Mm -hmm. make us better at that coaching ability. I definitely think so, Mm -hmm. yeah. I was surprised, though, to be honest, when I was looking around. I thought there would be more on parent training. Yeah, um, for challenging behavior. And just in general, even though there was still a lot, I was just surprised that there was so little, on specifically on challenging behavior and specifically on parent training. So they had, like, collateral effects. So maybe you did, like, some style of training in the mm-hmm. home, and then they looked to see if there was generalization, you know, in novel settings. Yeah. But that's quite different than actually training parents to do things yeah focusing specifically on parent training and there's been a lot of work in our field related to parent training many of the manuals that we Mm -hmm. use focus uh, at least in part on parent training so that's true of early intensive behavioral intervention as well as pivotal response training Mm -hmm. as well as the early start denver model all of them have important parent training components to it but the focus is largely most of the time on skill acquisition and ways to work on generalization in the home versus decreasing challenging behavior yeah Well, when all is said and done, we did come up with some papers to discuss. Now, there is one that that you both had mentioned was a a good read, but you felt wasn't quite in line with, I think, where we wanted our discussion to go for the episode. But you you did want me to to share. It's a really cool paper. Mm -hmm. I I like that lately we've been doing that. We've been sort of giving everyone at home the two articles that we're going to talk about in depth, which are most of the time single subject design research, and then we've also been giving people what I like to call the gravy article, which is the extra juicy backbone meta-analysis type paper. Mm -hmm. And that's what you have here. 
All right, so Diana, that, that gravy article you're talking about, I'm going to make sure everyone knows what it is, and the citation will be on the website. We had the article, Contingency Analysis of Caregiver Behavior, Implications for Parent Training and Future Directions by Stocko and Thompson from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2015. Now, did anyone want to do a very quick – I know it's a long article, so it's actually probably not going to be able to be a quick summary, but sort of a few words to give the audience sort of a flavor of what is in the article that they might want to check it out themselves. Yeah, so this article does a really nice job of bringing up some of the potential difficulties in having parent-implemented behavior programs – and one of the main things that it's focusing on is the effect of child behavior on parent behavior. So, you know, we always talk about having behavior plans and prescriptions for problem behavior for children and how the adult needs to respond in every situation. But what those don't always take into account is that it's really an intertwined relationship and the effect of the parent certainly, excuse me, the behavior of the parent certainly has an effect on the child's behavior moving forward. But the child's behavior most certainly has an effect on the parent behavior as well. And we talked a little bit on about that concept on our infant behavior episode, saying that when we hear crying of an infant, parents going to respond in whatever way they can to have that crying end. So their behavior is going to be maintained by escape from crying. While on the flip side, the child's behavior is going to start to be maintained by access to parent attention and things like that. So it goes both ways. And that's a lot of what they talked about here. And it, if you start to think about challenges of implementing challenging behavior treatments at home, you quickly come to the realization that the effects of the child's behavior on the parent could create some difficulties in implementation fidelity on the part of those challenging behavior treatment protocols. Corey talks some about that in this article, and I think that it's some really good points because it can be really hard, as I know firsthand, <laughs> trying to remain consistent and methodical in your approach to challenging behavior at home. Even when you have it all written out, when it's your own child, it's just that much harder to try and stay neutral and be consistent with it. My little kid just knows how to get my goose every single time and that makes it hard. So I think recognizing that those are potential concerns and difficulties in implementing challenging behavior protocols at home is a really important one as we move into talking about working with families. Right. And another thing they talk about too is prevention strategies. So hopefully they give us a little bit of tips on how to prevent parent training in the home. So how to teach more skills needed skills that uh, then you will may not mm -hmm. necessarily need parent training mm -hmm. because one of the challenges too with parent training is that once you teach a parent skills you want those skills to be maintained over time without your presence and that's yep. a huge challenge because there's tons of other competing variables mm -hmm. and competing contingencies yeah. such as your child behavior so that's one of the challenges that they talk about in fairly uh, in depth well, thanks for that summary on that article, folks. But let's get into our two main articles for the episode. The first is The Effects of Behavioral Skills Training on Caregiver Implementation of Guided Compliance by Miles and Wilder from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis, 2009. And our second article is Crone and Meta, Parent Training on Generalized Use of Behavior Analytic Strategies for Decreasing the Problem Behavior of Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder, a Data-Based Case Study from Education and Treatment of Children, 2016. So let's start with our Miles and Wilder article. And Jackie, you are going to take us through that one. Miles right? and Wilder sounds like a old-timey cowboy. Um, oh, I was thinking cops duo. Usually, I was thinking yeah. cop, cop duo. Miles Usually cop duo would be yeah. the... Yeah. Because Miles, that seems copy. Oh, well, Wilder seems cowboy. Oh. So maybe, maybe it's, it's a cop cowboy duo. Oh, it's, it's, we're taking it there. <laughs> New genre. <laughs> There'll be one with a cop car, one on a horse. Nice. <laughs> Both fighting crime. That's right. Might one be of a them time travel. We'll be killed in the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. That's funny. Um, well, no one's going to get killed when we read this article. This article. No. Let's, let's hope not. <laughs> Transition. <laughs> no one said those are my strong points. So this article looks at how researchers can train parents to do guided compliance. And this is a common intervention that 
we as behavior analysts may use when we find ourselves faced with some noncompliance for our children. So, yeah, so they use behavioral skills training to teach parents guided compliance uh, for noncompliance. And remember, behavioral skills training, BST, is one of my favorite things. A little bit of your favorite there. I always bring it up if you haven't noticed, guys. I'm like, oh, BST, BST. Mm -hmm. So remember, it typically includes a combination of instructions, modeling, role play, and feedback. And it's been used effectively to train safety abduction skills, Mm -hmm. gun prevention skills, sexual abuse prevention skills. So many skills. So many. Oh, and we just talked about... Training people to work in the field. Yeah, training people to work in the field. And our most favorite article, training people to be uh, in a vocational setting where their job is to be a blow-up character. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. That was really awesome. (laughs) But yeah, so they use behavioral skills training to teach guided compliance um, because this is a common... Not compliance is obviously a common problem that a lot of parents face. Mm -hmm. um, And it would be helpful Yeah, Whether you're comfortable with the term non-compliance or not we all know what we mean when we talk about non-compliance right so i'm gonna the definition was when the parent had given a a parent or caregiver had given a directive and the child did not uh, follow through with the directive within 10 seconds of the directive so that's non-compliance as it pertains to this article works for me yeah so they had three caregivers uh they had a kindergarten teacher a nanny And a mother of two. So Mm -hmm. I love this because they, you know, they spanned across lots of different areas. Yeah. Um, The broad spectrum. Yeah. Arlene was the kindergarten teacher. Maggie was the mother of two. And Laura was the nanny. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Your friend Drescher. Wow. I was like, why why is he laughing? (laughs) The second you said nanny, I've been waiting to do that. So So in the article, it got, got ready to go. Participants were included if they engaged in a non-compliant episode following a directive at least 50% of the time. And That's so a pretty was, high percentage. Yeah. So there's some problems going on right there, yeah. right? No wonder these three participants, these three caregivers really wanted to be part of this study. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Um, so they had three separate settings and three separate children that were in this study. Um, along with the three caregivers. So some of the data were collected in the home of the nanny and the mother. Some were collected at the school. And then they did some generalization probes later at playgrounds or outside areas. So that's good to note. Each session consisted of five trials. So what a trial consisted of was the demand. Whatever it was, it was different for each child. Then if the child complied the caregiver gave specific feedback and praise wow nice job putting your blocks away you're great or something like that if they did not comply which was most of the time in the beginning Mm -hmm. then the experimenter would walk the parent through the guided compliance so guided compliance consists of first telling the student what to do then waiting 10 seconds then telling the student what to do and showing them what to do. Mm-hmm. So put the toys away, put the toys away like this, and then waiting 10 seconds, and then they still don't comply, then physically guiding them to engage in the correct response. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so saying, that's putting the toys away. That's putting the toys away. <laughs> right. So the dependent measure was the percentage of correct implementation of the 10 components of the procedure. So they were very they were serious about this, and I love that. So they first wanted to make sure that the, the participant was making eye contact with the student, calling their name, giving a clear direction, Mm -hmm. articulating the demand clearly, phrasing the vocal response as a demand rather than a question. I think that's the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Right? It makes a big difference. It does. And that's where you saw, too, in the the results. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not repeating the demand over and over again, which is also super hard. That's really hard. Mm. (laughs) Because you're like, maybe they didn't hear me. Put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. That's me. Yeah, (laughs) waiting the 10 (laughs) seconds for the child to respond, delivering praise if they did it, recording the data, waiting at least five seconds to present another demand. So they really, like, outlined exactly what it should look like. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did, and they had a data sheet. And one thing I really like about it, and I'm moving a little ahead of myself too, is they took data on the caregiver behavior. They also took data on child compliance 
and noncompliance and did procedural integrity on the experimenter conducting the training. Nice. So they like really hit everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a nice piece to include. I think so too. Is the integrity of the training. Right. Yeah, because I mean that's kind of what you're looking at right mm-hmm. here. Like yep. does the is the training effective? And if you can't really say the training's effective unless you can say yes, I did the training correctly. Yeah. Cuz we read a lot of studies, I think, that say that they've used BST to produce the changes, but right. you don't always get information that's specific about how was it implemented and to with what degree of fidelity. So it's nice to have that. Right, yeah. So that was really nice. So they started off using baseline, and so during baseline session, the participant was instructed to deliver a demand to each of the childs, and these demands were selected because the children infrequently complied to them. My favorite one was Maggie was the mother. You knew I was going to bring this mm-hmm. up. <laughs> the Maggie was the mother of three kids, and then the one that they were working with was a four-year-old typically developing boy. Uh-huh. And the demand was, put the dog in the doghouse, yeah. which I think is amazing. And so they just went to different parts of the house that were equidistant to the doghouse, and they have three dogs, so they used all three dogs, and visiting dogs which i'm like how many dogs were visiting right like it was wow. a doggy play date i guess right and then i wasn't i was like is it a is it like a doll house and a dog and a like a fake dog but no it was it's a real, real dog. dog so how big were those dogs can you imagine like a four-year-old gently leading like a great dane right to the dog house? that's what i imagined and i like giggled um like marmaduke yeah like clifford <laughs> yeah right come on clifford and he's like so high clifford would do anything clifford would do anything for you yeah he's he's the big red dog so that was just one of the fun the other ones were fairly you know typical like put your toys away yeah do this but like bring the dog to the dog house i was like wow i kind of want to sing like a rap song (laughs) um while that was happening that's what they did during baseline and they actually used the baseline data to help the participants so they showed them the baseline session showed them their data and how well they did during the training, which I think is nice. Yeah. So they just weren't like, we took this data, they can't do it. Mm-hmm. They never can look at the data again. They actually use it as part of the training component, which yeah, I think nice. is nice. So first they did a written description of the procedure that included all of the components, and then they were given graphic feedback. So they got to graphic. see their... Graphic? Yeah, they got to see their baseline performance. Oh, I thought you meant like in gross detail. Oh, like, no. That's so graphic. No, <laughs> I, th- I think it was... Graft. Yeah. Okay. I think it was a graph showing, oh, you only got 36%. Like, here are the components out of the 10 component sequence that you got wrong. I'm, I'm assuming that's... That makes more sense. Right. It's not like TVMA. <laughs> right. Like, what? It's... We can't watch this. It's rated R. I don't think it's that. But then, so they showed them the graph. They had the procedures. Then the experimenter went through and talked to them about each of the components, what they did great, what they did... Not so great. And then they had to rehearse the guided compliance procedure with the child, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Because it kind of goes out of the behavioral skills training like model of like, you know, we're going to get the written instruction, mm-hmm. then I'm going to show you, then you're going to do it. So what they did is they gave you the written instruction, then you're going to do it, then I'm going to show you, then you're going to do it again. Which well, isn't, it's interesting. It's extra doing it. Yeah, practice, I guess. I guess, yeah. Right. Right after that rehearsal, so maybe they thought maybe they wouldn't have to do all of the other stuff. Right. <laughs> but it looked like they must have to. So after they did the rehearsal, then the experimenter modeled the correct behavior with the child and placed the emphasis on the specific things or components that the caregiver did wrong. So I think that's helpful. And then they just, then they gave it back over to the parent. So then they were providing role play and with the child, though. So it's not like real role play because it's actually happening. Right. So typically role play is with like the experimenter, but it seems here that it is not. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. I wonder if there was any reactivity on the part of the children. I know, right? It's like, They're like, all these people are watching me now with clipboards. <laughs> right. Probably should just and do it. And videotaping the session, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. So, but they weren't allowed to go to the post training sessions until they got 100% accurate across all 10 components. So they were, well then, you better rock this <laughs> junk. Then post-training happened. And one thing I will, I would have loved to see is actual training session data. 
So they didn't give that to us yeah. here. They gave us the pre-training and then the post-training data. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually like to see that training data um, because then it kind of gives me a little bit of knowledge about what mine may look like. Yeah, we later. don't know what kind of learners these caregivers were at right. all. Did they get it right away? Did they need extra practice? Which piece of it right. did they fall down on and need yeah. more practice on? Yeah. So that would have just been nice. You know, I know it was a brief report, it's only yeah. five pages. And they do say that the, the mean duration of training sessions was about 60 minutes. But how many sessions then? It doesn't tell us how many sessions. Or... It's broken up. Yeah. Or just no, it was. Of. Yeah, right? So I'm not sure. But that would have been interesting for me. Mm-hmm. But it's not here. Agreed. But that's okay. I bet I could call them and ask them for it. I've actually done that a couple times. Have you ever done that? Call Miles or Wilder. I'll probably call Miles because he's number one. Yeah, I'm gonna send a telegram. Yeah, Wilder. (laughs) (laughs) I'm gonna use my walkie-talkie with Miles. (laughs) But have you ever done that? It's actually pretty fun. To what? To email the author? Yeah, and ask for the raw data. I have. I didn't get it though when I did it. I did. It was from the 70s, too. I emailed an author from, like, 1979, and I was like, hey, do you have this? Uh, He's like, let me check in my garage. And then he did have (laughs) it, and he sent it to me. He's like, hope you have fun with this. It's old. And I was like, wow. No way. Yeah, it was pretty cool. That's awesome. I know. He, like, really adhered to the guidelines. Kept it forever. (laughs) Yeah, not just seven years. (laughs) 700 years. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Um, So post-training was similar to... The training sessions, except that the participants or caregivers only receive feedback about the previous session. They got some feedback on what they did the last session, but they didn't have any uh, role play or feedback within the session. Okay. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They couldn't, re- they couldn't rehearse or anything. Yeah. They just went with the flow. So then if they got 100% correct for three consecutive five trial sessions, then they were done with post-training. Do you think for Maggie she's saying who let the dogs out? I hope so, yeah. I hope so, too. Yeah. Who? 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 That was probably the reinforcer. Yeah. Oh, I hope. I yeah. hope so, too. Because he was four-year-old. Yeah. Mm. Was I would I would do it for that. Yeah, me, too. I actually had a student a long time ago who we couldn't find any effective reinforcers. Uh-huh. And he liked that song and the, it, I think it was Shaggy, Someone Caught Someone in the Bathroom. Oh, yeah. Remember that song? Yeah, I do. I can't remember. Creeping on the girl next door. Yeah, yeah. that one. Yeah. Something. I don't know all the words. I don't either, but that song on was the like... the bathroom floor. Yeah. yeah. So that was the most effective reinforcer. He would do anything to listen to that wow. song. Wow. We had this little... Um, it was like a robot. That's not true. It's like a little animatronic frog Ooh. that sang Salt and Peppers, Push It Real Good in the classroom and that was like everybody's favorite <laughs> oh she <laughs> real good like, anyway, yeah that's what he's saying it was a little frog it had a little outfit on oh. it was bizarre kind of seems a little inappropriate but i kind of like it yeah we went with it yeah good i like that it wasn't suggestive it was just a frog i know he's dancing that's true yeah it's a good song to to dance to <laughs> back to the article okay sorry <laughs> that's okay um after post training they did a generalization probe, and generalization probes occurred between three and six weeks after post-training, so that's nice. Pretty good. In novel settings for each participant. So what I was also wondering here is, did they bring the doghouse <laughs> to this outdoor activity? <laughs> because it said, for Maggie, the generalization probe was conducted at an outdoor park. So they don't... I was just wondering, <laughs> like, how... Maybe they brought a crate. Maybe, maybe, or it was a but dog I, friendly park. They had like a dog. Right, dog it was area. like a dog park. But I've been like thinking about this. Like, how did they manage to do this one? Like, bring the dog to the they dog house. The whole dog house. <laughs> <laughs> it's like on top of the car, right? <laughs> <laughs> Snoopy's standing on top of it. But I just thought that was interesting. So, if Miles or Wilder are listening, let us know, because that would be kind of interesting. Uh, but yeah, so that's what they did, and they saw, they saw pretty good results. You know, yeah. we saw low levels of independent responding on all ten components and baseline levels, but then following training, post training was at or around ninety ninety percent a percent correct and above mm-hmm. for all persons. This is the caregiver behavior. The caregiver behavior. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't <clears throat> tell you that. Yeah, it was really high levels and consistent levels across multiple sessions. 
their criteria was three levels, I mean, three sessions at 100% correct, but no one got below 90% correct, which is pretty interesting. Excellent. Yeah, um, during the post-training sessions. Good. Um, and then with generalization probe, Arlene still maintained 100% correct responding across all 10 p- components. It looks like Laura, who was the nanny, saw very slight decreasing trend, um, probably around like 95% or so. She must have missed one or so component. Um, and then Maggie had a little less responding. Maybe it's like 87% um, with that generalization for the, okay. probe for the doghouse. But, right. <laughs> but, you know, still fairly high for some facts. Being out in a park. Yeah. And the, she was in the elements. Right. She was in the elements. So I just think that's really nice is that they – You know, they really, I think they did a nice job here at covering their bases. Procedural integrity was high. Mm -hmm. IOA was high. They really wrote down the components of the caregiver behavior. They also saw that uh, child compliance increased, although the data are not present in this specific article, but we could email them. I'm sure they have them. Yeah, they have that data. Um, And, you know, for two of the children, they saw increased levels of compliance. For not one, they did not, but that's okay. Yeah. So I'm I'm happy with it. Yeah. I I thought it was good. So it just shows you another way that behavioral skills training can be effective across the board to teach skills. It's the secret message mm-hmm. of, of all the podcasts. <laughs> yeah, right? Everyone it's behavioral through, skills through training. Behavioral skills training. And it really is helpful because it, you know, not only does it strengthen the literature on behavioral skills training, but mm-hmm. it also shows us that we can use this procedure with caregivers with little mm-hmm. to no experience in behavior analysis. Mm-hmm. So these weren't like moms that have had years of experience working in home with their kids and their therapists and their caregivers because all of the kids had like, you know, typically developing or nonspecific learning disabilities. Yeah. So they didn't have a lot of experience with ABA or with this type of uh, procedure. So that's helpful. And then they were able to uh, maintain it and generalize it to a novel setting. Yeah. And I bet Arlene generalized it to other students. Oh, yeah. I bet she definitely <laughs> used it. She was the daycare mm-hmm. teacher. Yeah. And they did say that the one problem, the one common error that everyone made was phrasing the demand as a question, mm-hmm. which everyone does. Yeah. Right? Do you want to do your homework? No, of course I don't. Right? Then you're like, I'm now I'm screwed. Yeah. And also praising the child for compliance even after they guided them. Oh, okay. So mm. not not giving contingent responding on independent responding but on prompted responding mm. which these these things aren't horrible right but you know I like the question one that's 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 something that i know i try to get anyone i'm working with to minimize the amount of there's always that one at least one student or one kid who gets wise and says no i won't and then you're in the terrible position of saying <laughs> Well, I never actually cared. Ha ha. Now <laughs> yeah. do the thing I said. I'm sure yeah. you'll be compliant now. You misunderstood. My rule is always do not ask a child a question unless you really care what the answer is. Right. That's true. So if you're really, you know, I wonder, do you want to do your homework? I just, just inquiring minds want to know. But if the expectation is you're doing it. Yeah. It's I not, think a, I not a question, can professor. You a lot. Yeah. yeah. Can you go put your shoes on? No. Can you please go put your shoes on? Never. Right. Is what your kids say? They just don't say anything. They, or they don't they respond. Just don't they just anything. blank stare. No, they're like off. Children of the <laughs> corn staring. Things. We should have a creepy. St- comply. <laughs> Ooh. They did have two limitations of the study. One that they only taught one instruction. A very each. specific one. Mm-hmm. Bring the dog to the doghouse. <laughs> I mean, if it works, and so they can't really attest to the utility of. The guided compliance. Well, the effectiveness of the guided compliance across multiple directives or mm-hmm. if parents will actually use guided compliance with other directions. Right. Mm-hmm. So we don't know that. And we also don't know the difference between post-training and training, really, because mm-hmm. they did provide that specific feedback during post-training. Mm-hmm. So that's just a, a semi-limitation that they could think about in the future. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We saw good results, though, so I'm in. Yeah, definitely. So before we move on to our next article... For those of you practitioners out there who are listening who would like to apply for continuing education credit, which you can do for listening to our show for our episodes, you will need two secret code words that we've hidden throughout this episode. 
And our first secret code word is nachos. The delicious chip slash cheese slash maybe beef or chicken slash maybe chili or sour cream, jalapeno. You could put all sorts of stuff on those don't forget nachos. The black olives. Black olives. Oh, yeah. Plenty of things. You don't need to write all of those down. All you need to know is secret code word number one is nacho. N-A-C-H-O. Nacho. Let's move on to our next article on parent training. And, Diana, you're going to lead us in a discussion of Crone and Meta's parent training on generalized use of behavior analytic strategies for decreasing the problem behavior of children with autism spectrum disorder. So, away you go. All right. So, this article focuses on teaching parents how to implement behavioral intervention plan to work on decreasing challenging behavior during mealtime. And they did a really interesting job in that they uh, made a comparison between teaching the skills to parents with the child present initially in a home-like setting or a clinic setting. And then in both cases made comparisons to how well those skills then generalize over to an actual mealtime in the child's home. There were four parent-child dyads in the study and they address many different variables here. But what I first want to say is that the purpose of the study was in multiple parts. And I'm going to kind of quote a little bit from the article. So they wanted to look at evaluating the effectiveness of their training procedures for teaching parents of children with autism to implement a function-based intervention plan in a non-trained setting. They also wanted to look at the effectiveness of the parent training to decrease child problem behavior and then finally, they wanted to look at the role of the training location in response to neuralization, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So there were four children in the study who were all diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, and they each were in a dyad with their parent, the mother in all cases here. So the four children were Christian, who was age eight, and the, his sessions were conducted in a home-like setting. It wasn't in home. It was in like a little... I think in their facility, it was Mm. set up like a little mini kitchen. The clinic, yeah. Yeah. Matt was six years old, and his sessions were run in a clinic-like setting. Ryan was eight years old. His sessions were in a home-like setting. And then Kenny was six years old, and his sessions were in the clinic-type setting. Mm. And like I said, all of these uh, participants had challenging behavior related to meal times, so that is what the sessions were focused on. There were several dependent variables that they were looking at here. For the parents, they were looking at accurate implementation of both antecedent and consequence strategies that were related to increasing and decreasing the child's problem behavior. And those were, the parent behavior was what determined when sessions changed phases, when they started to target different skills rather than the child behavior. But they also focused on child problem behavior as well. They measured that too. The problem behavior of the children varied child to child of course but they included things such as flopping throwing silverware hitting the child's head climbing on the table bolting and out of seat behavior during meal times one interesting thing about this study was that they didn't actually tell us what each parent did for each parent so they didn't say like for christian's mom here are the things that she was working on Mm -hmm. i really would have liked that just generally. It would have been maybe nice to get a little more information yeah. related to that. And what exactly antecedent strategies and consequence strategies did you use? So they said that they were using them and they said, here are some examples of them. Mm-hmm. But it would have been nice to have specific examples for each participant. Yeah, and I think that might be why in the title of this paper they say they're looking at the generalized repertoire. Because right. there are main hangers that they want every parent to be able to do. Mm-hmm. More so than the specifics of what each individual behavior plan was you're right but it could have been in a table yeah yeah i like the idea mm-hmm. okay so to delve into more depth related to the dependent variables here they were looking at both correct and incorrect implementation of antecedent strategies and correct and incorrect implementation of consequence strategies for the parents again and remember this is all related to like one specific meal time arrangement so what they were looking for was the parent invite the child over to the table, present them with a choice of reinforcer to earn, and everyone had the same kind of basic meal plan of take three bites of the less preferred food and then access more highly preferred food. 
that's a topic for a different day, whether we like that as a feeding program or not, but that's what they were looking at <laughs> right. here as the whole package. And then there was a terminal reinforcer at the end of the meal. Right. And it was important to know, too, that parents needed to, like, get everything ready yes. before the child came to sit down yes, at the exactly. table. So that's important. So that was part of the antecedent strategy. So yeah. there were four of those that they were looking at, which included, did they conduct a mini preference assessment with the child to identify a reinforcer? Did they use clear expectations and language? Mm -hmm. such as come sit down did they have all the needed materials present before they invited the child to come to the table and did they have clear environmental cues set up like the chair pulled out so the child could sort of see oh it, it must be meal time i right. see my plate i see my chair ready for me mm -hmm. incorrect consequent excuse me incorrect antecedent strategies were basically the opposite of all those things like they're they didn't do a preference assessment they used generic language like oh are you hungry um, they did not have all the materials present, and they didn't have all the environmental cues ready. So the parents' uh, word behavior was measured on all, each of those components for antecedent strategies. And then for consequent strategies, they were looking to see if the parents provided contingent delivery of their reinforcer following appropriate behavior on the part of the child. Did they present three bites of food without additional prompting? Did they have the terminal reinforcer present but out of reach? I like that. During the you session. can see it, but you can have it. <laughs> yeah. Which was part of the environmental arrangement. Did they block problem behavior? And then did they redirect with only one verbal prompt followed by physical guidance when problem behavior did occur? So those were the things they were looking for. And then if that did not occur, that counted in the incorrect consequence strategy category. And those things included only providing verbal praise that was not very descriptive, such as just saying, great job. Um, not providing contingent reinforcement, following consumption of bites, allowing the child to leave the chair if problem behavior occurred, and then providing repeated verbal redirections. That's the one that I would get docked for. Yeah. Mm. I mean, all of these things are super common. So when we're yeah. talking about these parent training, I keep reminding myself that we're not saying parent training because the parents are like bad parents or they like need help or you know it's really yeah. just honing skills that they probably already have that they've forgotten or maybe well, they we don't all need help. help right yeah you know? everybody needs help i honestly i wouldn't know any of this stuff coming into being a parent without having prior experience working with children as an aba therapist yeah i don't, I don't know <laughs> yeah. I, what do you even know you know it's very true yeah and i think it's be also crying because they're hungry right it's all you know that's <laughs> true. And that's probably all I know right <laughs> now. And not like this food, so I'm going to let them leave. I mean, like, that's that's common sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And if you don't have this type of background, you don't – doesn't become clear that, oh, it might be shaping up this repertoire of challenging behavior. Like, that yeah. – those are not – it's not language that you ever – would ever think of. Right. And sometimes I think parent training is helpful because you're so close in the situation. So I know I've talked yeah. so many times about my bad dogs. Um, well, <laughs> one I have good dog and one I have bad dog. I actually knew what I needed to do mm -hmm. when my bad dog was displaying her least reactive behavior. Like, for the most part, I had a general knowledge. Obviously, yeah. I didn't know the quite subtle cues of, you know, like dog behavior because I didn't know that yet. And now I do. But yeah. I knew what I needed to do, but I, that doesn't mean I did it, Yeah, too. <laughs> right? Like, I was just like, why is she being so bad? Yeah. And then I would cry, which isn't helpful. Yeah. But talk about the child or dog effects on your behavior. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. It all comes back around. It really does. They really feed on one another. So if your child's upset about something, then you're going to react in a much different way than you would if you were at work and trying to do right. these problems. Right. So it's just something I just wanted to like put it as a side note that parent training is really important, not because we think parents are inadequate, oh, yeah. but because it's a hard job. It's probably the hardest job you'll ever have. Yeah, so, I completely agree. Yeah. Yeah. So these are good reminders for everyone. These are all related to really you know, concrete things. It probably helps many parents to have it written out and, and kind of laid out and also almost the freedom to say this is what you should do you don't have to try to make all those decisions in the moment like this is the this is the protocol this is the order right stay consistent with it do this every time and almost being able to kind of let that go and have it written down and not be trying to figure it out mm -hmm. differently every time it's a little bit freeing i bet too. i bet it's mm -hmm. helpful too yeah mm -hmm. 
So the design that they used in this study was a partially concurrent multiple baseline. Like I said, there are four parent-child dyads, so some of them were conducted at different points in time, but the final two pairs, which were Ryan and Kenny, were conducted simultaneously in time. So it was a partially concurrent Good multiple baseline design. It's hard to do. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Plus, they probably only had one kitchenette, so. Yeah. <laughs> And let me tell you a little bit about what the protocol was. So the first thing that they did was run the FAST in order to make an attempt at determining the function of these children's challenging behavior. And the FAST stands for the Functional Assessment Screening Tool. It's a interview-based format and might give you some information. So it's a descriptive assessment. It might give you some information about why the behavior is occurring. But is it going to give you an exact function? Jackie's no. shaking her head no. Rob shaking his head no. no. It's not because it's not a functional analysis. So they, you know, they don't pretend that it is, but they say that they did was they did this assessment and then they hypothesized what the function most probably was based on the assessment and then they used that to inform their treatment planning. Right. They also did some direct observation, too, following yeah. the assessment. So they, they didn't just do the assessment and then be like, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> they did a little bit of um, observation as well. So that's what we have to go on there. They then did some baseline to see what responding looked like uh, without an additional treatment plan in place. And then they implemented their parent training. So one phase of the parent training was the experimenters writing that behavior intervention plan based on the information that they had on how they were going to respond. And this is what you're saying, Jackie. It would have been, I think it also would have been nice to have Kenny engages in out-of-seat behavior. We propose that that's escape maintained. So therefore, we're recommending that the parents do this. Yeah, that would be nice in an appendix. Yes. They do include, when they talk about the consequence strategies, that they're asking all the parents to redirect challenging behavior and keep the kids in their seat. Right. So they're not allowing escape from the table, and they're also presumably not providing a lot of attention for the behavior. Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's less, I guess that's less, that's less clearly clear. laid out. Right, because that could be, you know, just getting your child in the seat and keeping a child in the seat can... Yeah, well, they say only provide one verbal prompt. Yeah. So there's that piece of it, too. So presumably if the function of the behavior is attention or escape hopefully that's going to be relatively covered in yeah. that basic hopefully. behavior intervention plan when they did the parent training they broke it down into six components for each component they provided an explanation and discussion portion and then a modeling and a practice portion and the six components were these are the things that they were looking for for parents to do deliver clear instruction follow a parent checklist they modeled strategies for parents and then had them do them. They provided guided practice in the simulated setting. They gave them direct and immediate feedback. And then they had the opportunity to generalize those skills to the real meal setting. So they took time to have the parents practice each component of the treatment. And basically what they were doing sounds a lot like behavioral skills training. It does, mm -hmm. yeah. They don't mm -hmm. call it that, but they right. have... Instruction, mm -hmm. modeling, and feedback. Right. And, and, and okay. practice, sorry. Yeah. And practice and then feedback, which are all the components that you would see in behavioral skills training. So that, they don't call it that, but it, it does kind of sound that way. It does. And that is what they did. So to look at the graphs, they have two graphs. What they were focused on here was percentage of accurate and inaccurate implementation of the antecedent and consequence strategies on the part of the caregivers in the first graph. And everyone's data look pretty similar. I kind of like here that they looked at both the appropriate responses and inappropriate responses. So they graphed both. Yeah, it's kind of nice. I think that's nice. Yeah. So what, what we saw with each of the participants is that before training occurred, inaccurate responding averaged right around 80 to 100%. It's not her. what you want. Nope, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and correct responding was the inverse of that. So it was really between, you know, 0 to 20%. Following intervention, which again was established in a multiple baseline design, accurate responding increased to between 80 and 100% for all participants. And then there were also opportunities for generalization as well to the home, real meal home setting. 
And those looked great. For the first participant, they were slightly lower than uh, the other participants, but everyone, again, was pretty much between 80 and 100% for the accurate responding and 0 to 20% for the inaccurate responding. That's impressive. Responding. Yeah. yeah. Looks good. Yeah. So it looked really good. And as you saw or heard, there were a lot of components <laughs> to, to this whole thing. So they, they tried to cover their bases here. And then in the second graph... These are the data for the problem behavior on the part of the children. So this is nice, Jackie, in that here we did get those right. behavior data for the children. So everyone had different problem behavior that was being measured, and it was measured in different ways. So there's that. Certainly that's taken into account when you're looking at this graph. But overall, baseline data were relatively high and variable for each of the participants before treatment was implemented. Following parent training... Challenging behavior was much lower for everyone. Yeah, and some even had near zero rates, which is pretty awesome. For Christian, Ryan, and Kenny, their rates of challenging behavior following parent training were at near zero rates, which is quite impressive. We can talk more about feeding maybe at another time, but it's not always the easiest thing It's hard to, yeah. to implement mm -hmm. and get challenging behavior reduced for. So those are really quite nice results that they had. And then for Matt... His data were just a little bit more variable. The rates that we were looking for here for him, the measurement that they were using for him was percent intervals. Before training, it was between 80 and 100%. Following training, it was some were still as high as 40%, some were around 0%. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit more variability in yeah. his data, even at follow-up. Uh, however, overall, challenging behavior was reduced for all participants following the implementation of the parent training protocol. Social validity, they also did that for the moms, and they had some good data there. I love that in the discussion they say, anecdotal notes suggested that the parents were surprised at how well their children responded to the implementation of antecedent and consequence strategies. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it worked. I think, you know, the biggest part of that is, is just consistency. Right. Yeah. Oh, 100%. But I love that they were like, I'm so surprised. Yeah. Because you really, it seems like nothing Right. will help sometimes in these situations. Yeah. Even if it's not the perfect behavior plan, right? Even if there's ways that you could maybe make it a little more sophisticated or more nuanced, it's just the consistency of mm -hmm. not allowing escape, right? Not responding right. verbally and having that reinforcement in place and being presented consistently. Like those pieces, if you can get that into place, then there's a good chance that you're going to see positive right. results. And they did. Yeah, they did. Which is good. So there are certainly some limitations to this study. I think there's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, there's it's a lot going on. A lot going on in this study. And, you know, we don't have, like we kind of already talked about, there's, I'm, I'm drawing with my hands. There's like, it's like a general <laughs> package that we're looking at here. Like we're trying to teach all parents everything about how to interact with, in the context of these behavior plans. And that, that I think that's very true to life. Yeah. But it makes for a little bit of a complicated read. A complicated read and a complicated replication. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of just unknowns about what exactly did this look like and and how would you go about making it again. There's also the aspect of not doing the functional analysis and you don't right. fully get the function of the behavior for the kids. That would have been nice to have. Another thing that well. I was a little bit concerned about too is because they're dealing with food, they yeah. didn't talk about referring first to a medical doctor you're right yeah, to make sure concerning. to make sure that it's not something mm -hmm. biological and that it is actually behavioral mm -hmm. so that's something i hope that they did and they just didn't report yeah because it is part of our ethical guidelines now mm -hmm. to always rule out biological variables bef variables before we do do any type of assessment so that Definitely. i was like "Ooh, i hope they yeah. did that <laughs> hopefully we just don't didn't get that piece of right, information yeah. Yeah. maybe they had to cut out some words yeah because this is a big article. Like a so recent pediatrician appointment right. or something. Yeah, yeah at least something. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That was one thing. I like that one of the other limitations they posit is that everyone was really well educated and that's why it worked <laughs> so well. I'm not sure that maybe. I mean. I think they're just saying they had a limited sample. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can't speak to the right. generality of the findings to other populations. It's like all participants were educated and employed, belonged to a relatively upper middle class family with a fairly stable life and appeared able to fluently communicate with the interventionist. Hmm. That's nice, but I'm... Yeah, I, mean, I think better to note that than not note it. Right. Mm. 
Yeah. But it just, I just thought it was funny. It was kind of that funny. <laughs> They've got their junk together, so that's why it worked. Right. And it was they, another article we came read a long session. time ago. I remember I had, remember had something along those lines. <laughs> yeah. It was like, they were all very well off. They lived in mansions. It, was, it seemed very irrelevant to the but It was the because study. it was a university, a university-based preschool. I actually remember yeah. this because oh, okay. I laughed. Yep. Like, everyone can speak multiple languages. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's got to be a more tactful way to write that in, your, know, in right? your research paper. So what I did like about this article is that it seemed very much a real life to research. Absolutely. Article. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. This is what they did. And they tried real hard and they did succeed. Mm-hmm. This is it's messy because real life is very often messy and working with parents, there's so many different variables at play and they did their best to try and distill it down and even though these kids had different challenging behavior they sort of tried to stick it all together so that there was something to hang on to and and speak to the larger training that they were providing to the parents so I appreciated that a lot this is when we are doing parent training with families I think this is a lot of what it can look like when it's done well right so trying to capture that on paper isn't easy at all and that's that's what the attempt was here so i really appreciated it for that reason i did too mm-hmm. yeah. yeah it's very yeah. nice so i guess with with our two articles out of the way it's time to pull into dissemination station <laughs> so what were our big take-home points for folks listening at home sort of the you're about to park your car and you're going to get out and, and don't forget these points as you go about your day parent training is important that's a softball I just threw to you there. I know, parent. right? And I hit all it out of the park. All of this stuff is the best. No, I think it's it's super important because I'm not around all the time. You know, like mm-hmm. Diane is not around all the time. So mm-hmm. if we can give parents tools to effectively work with their children mm-hmm. um, in everyday life, I mean, it's going to be better for them. They're going to be less stressed. They're going to be more confident. Mm-hmm. And then in turn, their children are going to see more predictability, more consistency, and usually have less problem behaviors if we can implement good parent training for these complex, challenging behaviors. A sad thing, though, is that there's not a lot of research out there. Mm -hmm. I know. I know why. I mean, like, we can kind of posit why. But I was a little disappointed, actually. I was surprised that there is not very much out there, assuming that I'm searching for it under the right terms. Well, and for increasing behavior, you had a much... Definitely. You know, we had, There's lots there out were there. many more options for increasing. Mm-hmm. It was decreasing that, that seemed to have the the lower amount of published research right. available. Yeah. And again, we're all recommending that if there's any type of serious challenging behavior happening in the home, that, that any type of implementation of reduction programs should be overseen by a behavior analyst. Right. Mm-hmm. But that to me doesn't explain why there's not a lot of research out there Mm -hmm. because parents do still need to be trained many 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 children who engage in you know relatively significant challenging behavior continue to live at home Mm -hmm. right and And continue to destroy their homes Mm -hmm. sometimes yeah yeah what i like about both of these articles is that they're working to teach an overall uh, useful repertoire right on the part of the parent so yours was guiding compliance and mine was general how to address challenging behavior in the sense of right. don't give it a lot of attention and redirect. Follow through. Yeah. Yeah. And those could be applicable across multiple different settings, multiple different types of challenging behavior, at least until you can get someone else in there to take a look at it with expert eyes and give yeah. you more, more to go on. Yeah. It's good. It's good research. Mm-hmm. We need more of it. We yeah. need a lot more of it. Yeah. Working with these types of repertoires, I think that although it's a little nebulous to pin down exactly what's going on these are repertoires that we could be teaching to parents and having them be applied in different settings in different ways Mm -hmm. and continue to look at the fidelity of the implementation on the part of the parents as well as the reduction in challenging behavior on the part of the child it would it would be helpful yeah many families Mm -hmm. yeah i like it and there's many practitioners too to get a little better handle on how should we best help parents to, Mm -hmm. to work with some of those you know, my, milder challenging behaviors. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think Beyonce, the... I thought you just said Beyonce. I think... Yeah, I, I thought you said the what? I thought you said Beyonce. No, I don't, Beyonce want to, I don't want to talk says. about Beyonce. No, 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 no. No Beyonce tangents. You didn't say no. that? I didn't say Beyonce. 
beyond the mm. oh both diana and i heard beyonce well yeah. you, you know i'd like to see more research for all the single ladies all the single <laughs> you know the single mom ah, ha, ha. now all the single moms yeah. the single... <laughs> so beside your point diana about the intensity of behavior might be a reason we don't see so much research on the parent training component you, know, you bring up the good point of well it's great. Well, it's great. It's, it's necessary to have something in place and have a behavior analyst and solely behavior analyst looking at decreasing a behavior that is of severe intensity, that is increased possibility for injury mm -hmm. for the student, for the parents, for the environment, for the community. But it's sort of one of those things. We talk about this sometimes when we're looking at the articles of well, what about the generalization? What about the extension of this? It's great to decrease something for the, the – we have to do something to decrease this behavior for safety. But then what do you do if, if it doesn't maintain over long periods of time? And, and there aren't that many articles I, I read that have anything other than, say, maybe the three-month or six-month follow-up. Mm -hmm. Usually those are about more acquisition skills than they are decreased behavior. Sometimes, sometimes they are. And that is an important piece because it's great that you can go to the clinic and say, all right, we did it. SIB is down to almost near zero rates. Bye. Right. Here's the paper right. we wrote about your kid. Yeah, you can read that ya. and see what happens. And that that is that is a big big challenge. But like you said, yeah. something must be going on because it's not a matter of and every child with a severe disability is in a, a state hospital by the time they're twelve. And we know that's not the case. So people are making do, but are they making do in a way that is sustainable? That is leading to better outcomes over the long term. I wish I could say, yeah, of course they are, but mm -hmm. I think we're all a bit skeptical that, yeah. that that's always happening. I agree. Yeah. Life is difficult. It's so challenging to, you know, there's so many competing things happening at home. Mm -hmm. Parents usually have multiple children. They are working themselves. After the kids are home from school, it's the evening witching hour when everyone's tired, cranky. And hungry, and you're I don't trying know what you're to make dinner. About. That's not my house. Everybody's <laughs> so cheery when they get. They're like, "We're so lucky to be home." These are all my hypothetical children, right. by the way. They're like, "I love you, mom, so much." You had a wonderful day. Let me tell you. Let me show you all of the art projects I made, <laughs> and then I'll make you more. And then I'll go right away, take a bath, eat all my dinner, and go to bed by eight p.m. So you and dad can have some alone time. <laughs> That's yeah, my not house. Everyone's house is like that. <laughs> It's because I don't have children, guys. <laughs> so the challenges that are being asked of these parents are, are great. Great is in great magnitude. Not great right. like awesome. No, yeah, exactly. Of great magnitude. So I think that it's appropriate to provide some strategies to help with this. But I think I think that the ways these two articles are trying to tackle it is, is also appropriate. Let's give mm -hmm. them, you know, it's like the teach a man to fish parable you read a different article there was no fishing in any of these oh, just it. there was dog housing and you teach him to fish you give him a fish he eats it you teach That's him it. to fish you give him he gives you a lifetime or something <laughs> <laughs> that is, i feel like you're really is. close <laughs> remember i'm teach not a man to fish no give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime i was close is that right yeah. <laughs> he'll give you all the lifetimes yes I Teach a man to fish. He has more time to watch Lifetime Network. <laughs> I did look it up. Um, you're right. I got it. I think mine was better though. Did, is it? A, is it? It's a Confucius. It's the oldest no. <laughs> English language use of the proverb. Have been found in Anna Isabella Thackeray Ritchie's novel Mrs. Diamond in a slightly different form. Whoa. Okay then. Yeah, I actually have that book. Mrs. I've never Diamond? even heard of that book. Yeah, I've never read it, but I have it with my grandma's. Wow. Okay. So yeah, it's like that parable. Yeah, or saying I guess not, it's not a parable. I think that's like a Bible I story. Think so. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! In that, if we can teach parents how to effectively look at the problem that's being presented, use the behavioral an analytic knowledge that they have, and thereby address the problem in a way that's hopefully going to make it decrease and not increase over time, then that's a skill that is applicable to many, many, many different problem behaviors. And as we know, problem behavior continues to crop up and change and morph into different things over time. So these are good approaches mm. and something that I think we could 
definitely be looking to have more research. I agree. In. Even in some of the, the ability for follow-up, the selling the idea of some of these treatments, because these are the published articles because they work pretty well. Right. They had a high degree of consistency. But I know we've all had parents who they, they want to do more. We think we can help them do more. And it just never materializes quite the same way. Mm -hmm. What's the limiting factor? It's simple to say, well, they've got so many competing other reinforcers and they've got so many barriers to their ability to do some of these skills long term. But we can't just shrug our shoulders and say, yep, it's impossible then, I guess, because that's just not that's just not part of the right part of the job. And it, it can't be impossible that there has to be something to be done and. It's beyond our little show to, to, to figure that out. but Right. And they weren't really reflected in the articles that we saw. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why it's important to have, often have meetings with yeah. families. Mm -hmm. Right. To talk about these issues. It's an ongoing problem solving process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And related to what you were saying, Rob, it's, there are plenty of articles out there that work on decreasing challenging behavior and then might also include a generalization component at the end where the parent might step in right and implement strategies so uh, we didn't look at any of those mm -mm. articles because we were really looking at parent training from the get-go yeah. on decreasing challenging behavior but that's def definitely another strategy that could be put into place is having practitioners initially address challenging behavior and then probe for generalization to parents or to the home setting and if that doesn't occur then, do then implement mm -hmm. additional yeah. parent training which is more common i think yeah. yeah yeah the tenor i usually get from those articles is and then we just had the parents come in and do it and it all worked out fine <laughs> yeah. and that's i'm glad that i'm glad that happens and sometimes <laughs> it does happen that yeah. way but wouldn't it be better to say and we did this and we hoped it worked out fine but just in case it doesn't we've got the following in our Right. In our toolbox. Yeah. That happens a lot with behavioral skills training, actually, because behavioral skills training alone sometimes isn't as effective. So you have to use behavioral skills training plus in-situ training mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with parents, and that's been more uh, that's been proven to be effective. So that's one way that they were like, oh, it didn't work, but let's keep going. Yeah. yeah. But that might be more of the give them a fish. Yeah, I agree. Versus the teach them to fish. Yeah, we'll mm -hmm. see. Yeah. It's more like you kind of you start fishing, and then you're like, I think I got something. Let me pass the rod to you, and you'll pull it back in. Right. Oh, right. I like that. Good, yeah. Rob. There you go. If you, if you could teach oh. a man, if you give a man a fish, he's got a fish. If you just kind of give him the rod while fishing, I guess they also got a fish, and it's a little better than before. <laughs> Indirect fishing. But if you teach them to fish, then it's like a childhood. They'll give it's you the lifetime. Child lifetimes. fishing. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I had a Snoopy fishing rod. Hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. What'd you catch? What'd you catch to that bad boy? Snoopy. You caught. You caught a Snoopy. <laughs> a Snoopy snow cone machine. No, I, I love those. I, I always want. I had one. one. Listeners, send in your Snoopy Snow Cone <laughs> machines. Care of. We'll Rob. take them all. Yeah. One, two, three, podcast street. I had that thing too. One, two, three, podcast It just took like street. 20 minutes. You got a little fake cup. Uh -huh, it was delicious. It was so good though. Mm -hmm. It was so special. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Well, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that if you are listening to this for CEs and didn't turn us off at that Snoopy Snow Cone machine uh, tangent. Hey, now. You had, I, that was my fault. You had the Snoopy fishing rod. Snow Cone machine. I, I went off a cliff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The second code word you're going to want to have if you're applying for CEs is cowboy, C-O-W-B-O-Y, cowboy, like yeehaw. the Old West, like the yeehaw, riding ropes and broncos, cowboy. <laughs> well, Jackie and Diana, thanks so much for sharing all your knowledge on the topic and for discussing these articles with me and with everyone at home who is listening. Sure thing. You're welcome. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have for this week's episode. Thanks to everybody at home who is listening. Remember, you can apply for continuing education credits for listening to our episode. You can just click the info button on your podcast machine and enter your information. Or you can go to our website at abainsidetrack.com. You can find us online everywhere pretty much as ABA Inside Track. If you haven't been to the Facebook page lately and liked it and posted something about whatever you're working on or any sort of questions, we've been really doing a lot to try to put various links and articles that we found either on Twitter or we found ourselves or we've gotten through mailing lists because we really would like to make sure that we have people who are discussing the various articles and various topics in ABA. Uh, I know it can be hard sometimes if you are in a state or if you're in a city or town that doesn't have a 
group of BCBAs that you can sort of pal around with, discuss research. We'd love to make sure that there's there's always a community available, whether it's ours or, or another one. But there, there, there are lots of places out there to, to discuss these important, important topics. And if you ever have a question or recommendation for an episode topic like we had today, please email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with our preview episode where we discuss what our next big long topic will be. But until then, keep responding. Bye!